Um, my name is Brian Postumas. I'm the statewide hunter outreach coordinator with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And we're, we want to reach out to all of you and, and share. Um, we call them secrets to the big game draw, not, not because they're really secrets, but the real thing is there's a lot of people that, that put in for the draw and they really don't know um, all the ins and outs of it. And so what we want to do is we want to take a little time to help you understand all of the opportunities to get a big game license in Colorado. It is very complicated. Um, the complexity, though, once you understand it, it gives you an opportunity to draw some really good tags. So we're going to talk tonight, um, starting out, we're going to do some introductions in a minute. We're going to talk about the brochure. If you don't have your 2021 big game brochure um, with you, we're going to um, send a link in the chat feature in just a minute so you can pull up a PDF and look at that. Otherwise, if you have your copy, go ahead and grab that so you can get, maybe make some notes in it. We will refer to several pages that are going to be helpful for you as we as we work through this. We're going to talk about the different types of licenses. We'll get into just how does the draw work because because you really got to know how the draw works in order to understand how to take advantage of it and play the game. We're going to talk about some of those special licenses, the stuff that you need to be thinking about um, to, to take advantage of those as well. Some of them are, are little known. They're, they're available to anyone to, to read through and understand, but sometimes they're, they're a little complex. We're going to talk about some of the resources you can use to help you pick some good tags. And then um, we'll, we're going to finish it up and, and try and talk a little bit of philosophy on how, how might you come up with a plan so that you could hunt every year, right? And make some long-term plans as well. Um, if you're not following already, we do have an Instagram account for our hunter outreach program. Um, it's called hunting in Colorado, all one word. We're going to be promoting um, more webinars. We're going to be promoting um, a really neat series that just kicked off last week. Um, Nate Zielinski from Tightline Outdoors is doing a big game hunting series. Um, we're kind of doing this in parallel. We're doing some programs. We're going to repeat each other a little bit here and there, but he's got a, a really good program that, that's going to take you all the way through the year. He's going to talk a lot about scouting, um, how to scout effectively, and he's also going to be doing some programs for you live um, right before the season starts. He'll have some video content available as well. So if you guys want to um, tie in on that, um, we'll announce some of that on CPW Facebook. We're also going to um, promote that on the Hunting in Colorado Instagram page. So if you want to follow either one, go for it. We'd love to have you join us. Love to try and share some information with you. So um, starting off, I want to thank all of you that are interested in hunting or if you're buying hunting licenses and fishing licenses. That, that is the money that, that drives the wildlife management side of, of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So game animals, non-game animals, um, hunting licenses. Are, are, a, are a major funding source for what we do and how we do it. It also provides the places for you to go hunt and fish as well. So um, continue buying those licenses. And I'm, I'm gonna encourage you as well, if you haven't had the opportunity to, um, to take someone with you hunting, start asking around. There's a lot of people that have no, no access to friends or family that they're aware of that hunts. All they need is an invite. So I encourage you to invite some people to go out with you. A couple of things for tonight. Um, if you're logged in on the Zoom webinar, um, we have turned the chat feature off. So you can't chat to us, but we can chat to you and we'll be sharing some links with you as well. Um, we've, got, uh, uh, we've got someone that is monitoring Facebook as well. And Doug is gonna be sharing some stuff on Facebook comments. So if you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, you can communicate through us and to us through that as well if you got some questions. From the, the Zoom webinar, um, there is a Q&A feature, and that, that is your best way to communicate with us. So if you want to, if you got a question for us, you got something you want to reach out to us, just hit the Q&A. we got some folks that are, are kind of running the background that are looking at those questions and answers. They're going to be typing some of that stuff that answers back to you, um, or maybe they'll, they'll interrupt us and say, hey, we got a good question here. Let's answer it live. So we've got a lot of ways to communicate with you. We want to tie in with you. Um, so if you got some questions, um, just remember that that the focus to tonight is the big game draw. Um, you know, I, I try not to tell people when they ask me, hey, what unit should I start hunting in? That That's a hard question to answer. And, and I don't know if we've got the time tonight to really deal with that. So um, let, let's focus tonight. Good questions on um, the big game draw, um, how to get licenses. Um, I think that's pretty good for uh, introduction of what we're doing tonight. Um, let's do some introductions on who is helping us out as panelists tonight. So um, 
let's start with Josh. Um, Josh, can you introduce yourself, please? Um, name's Josh Milby. I'm a district wildlife manager in Northeast Colorado, specifically uh, Yuma County. Great, thank you, Josh. How about Emily? Hi, I'm Emily Bosch. I'm a customer service representative at the Fort Collins office. Great, thank you, Emily. Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy Predmore. I'm the education coordinator in the Southeast region. Great, and Logan. I'm Logan Wiggins. I'm a district manager in the South region, downtown uh, in Lamar. All right, I, I had a hard time um, hearing Logan um, just a minute ago, but just, just to let you guys know that that's Logan. He's a district wildlife manager, a wildlife officer. Um, down, way down south, south, um, southeast region of Colorado. So um, thank you all for, for uh, being willing to help us tonight as uh, panelists. We're going to kind of go through a couple of different um, things here. So I'm going to get all of us started here on um, getting familiar with a brochure. So if you have your brochure, and I'm going to um, try to um, do a copy of that. Um, actually, I'm going to ask... Um, if, if maybe Tracy, if you don't mind grabbing that um, that link to the brochure, um, the big game brochure and the sheep and goat brochure, and go ahead and post that into the chat to everybody. Um, if you don't have your paper copy of the brochure, um, go ahead and, and hit that link. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, um, maybe we can get Doug to, uh, to load the link in. Oh, it looks like he already did that. Thank you, Doug. Um, all right, so the big game brochure, um, this is something that, that is really important. You ought to have that available to you um, every year. You can pick them up for free at most um, CPW, well, any CPW office. You can also pick them up at most of the places that sell hunting and fishing licenses. So you can get them, they're, they're free of charge. Um, I like to get two or three copies. I like to have one in my truck. I might have one in my pack so it gets all folded up, but at least I have one out there. If I got a question out in the field, I don't have to walk back to camp. Um, and then I have one at home just I can take notes on. So I think it, it's a great resource. So a couple of things starting out um, to just, just get familiar with it. Whenever you get your brochure, I want you to turn to the back page. We have dates. Um, what's really critical is that you know the deadline for the, that application. So we have two, we're going to have two applications. We'll get more into that. We got a primary draw and a secondary draw. We got leftover days. What are those dates? Well, you're going to find them on the back page. So put those in your calendar. Don't wait until the last day. I encourage hunters, if you're going to apply, have a target deadline of one week before the deadline. Um, it doesn't help you in the draw, but if you have issues, um, you actually have a week to solve those issues. Once the deadline is done, the deadline is done. And, uh, right, and this year, the deadline is going to be um, April 6th. Um, 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So April 6th, make sure you get your applications in before that. Um, and then there's some other dates in here as well. Um, the other thing that I think you should know, and, and if you're not familiar with it, it's called Game Management Units. And it's the back page inside flap of the brochure. And this back page is, is a map of the state of Colorado. And the state of Colorado is broken up into game management units. That's how we manage our wildlife. Wildlife populations go up and down. And if we want to maintain these populations into the future so that we have healthy populations to hunt, sometimes we've got to adjust how many hunters are allowed to get licenses out there. So if, if, if we're overpopulated, we bump up those licenses. If we're under our target populations, we have to drop those licenses. So this is a way that we manage the wildlife. Um, when you get a limited license and even some of the over-the-counter licenses, you're going to have to focus on where you want to hunt and you're going to need to know the game management units. So the, so the real easy map is in the back page. Um, if the other page that I think is really helpful is you turn the inside flap and I know my uh, screen is kind of going goofy on here. Um, the inside flap, it gives you the contacts. This is the offices um, around the state for CPW. If you have a question and that you want answered, you're, you're thinking, oh, I, I'm going to go hunt over by the Steamboat Springs area. Um, you can call all the offices, but you're probably going to get the best help. The most information is going to be available um, at, at the closest office. So that's a good place to start. 
Um, you can contact that office. I'll have good local information as well. Then maybe I'll get in touch with some more resources out there too. So, um, so they, that is a resource for you. There's great customer service representatives. They're trained to know um, how to answer questions. And, and, and if you do stump them, which doesn't happen too often, if you do stump them, they'll track that answer down. They're great, great folks. Um, some of the smartest people we have in our agency. So, um, so that's the inside flap. The other thing is about the brochure. We got a lot of rules and regulations in it. Um, if you haven't read through those rules and regulations, you really need to. You need to go through each page, um, read through them, understand them. If you don't understand them, contact the offices and get the answers, right? Like, can you explain this to me? Right? You want to go into the season with confidence that you're doing the right thing, right? And we, no one wants to mess up out there in the field. Um, and, and so if you go out there knowing the rules and regulations, you have the confidence going out in the field. But Every year, we're going to have some changes, right? These are dynamic populations. We manage them in a dynamic way. So we're going to end up having a what's new section on the very first page of the brochure. So when we make changes from year to year, you want to read through this. So if you're already familiar with the brochure and the rules and regs, make sure you read through the first page before you go hunting and probably before you even apply, right? Because there may be some things that affect you. So that, that's probably enough on those brochures. Um, Let's talk real quick as well. If you um, are, um, if you have your brochure open, turn to page four of your big game brochure. Um, there's some important stuff that you want to know um, about qualifying licenses for the limited draw. And again, we're going to get into the limited license, um, what that is, and, and kind of understand the draw process. But there's a section right right at the top of page four that talks about qualifying licenses. When you apply for a big game. Um, application, right? When you apply for, for the tags, you have to purchase a qualifying license. And there's a, a couple of options in there, um, either an annual resident, non-resident small game, annual resident combo small game fishing, um, annual resident senior combo small game. Um, we've got uh, resident and non-resident spring turkey are a qualifying license. So if you're going out spring turkey hunting and you got, got that spring turkey license, that, that's a qualifying license just to get into draw. Then we got a couple other ones as well. Um, there's some stuff for the resident, non-resident. You can read through this. There's a couple more options in there. So go ahead and read through and see once if that fits you and, and um, kind of your, your situation. Um, and then if you turn to um, page three, so just flip back one more page, um, there's going to be some information here um, that talks about the different types of licenses. And um, I'm going to just briefly talk about the limited licenses. We're going to get more in depth here as we kind of talk as well. But a limited license, this is a license that um, it is limited in um, what you get to hunt, right? Like the species. It, it's, um, you know, is it antlered or non-antlered or is it an either sex animal? Um, there, it's also limited in, in the game management unit or GMU that you're hunting in, right? So you're going to be limited in where you can hunt. Um, you're going to be limited in um, maybe the lands that you can hunt on. There's some, some tags that are available. Um, you can hunt on both public and private. Always have permission for private all the time, right? Um, but there are some private land only, and we call them PLO tags, but there's private land only tags. You can only hunt on private land on those. So you, And again, you have to have permission first. Um, we've got um, uh, the, all these limited licenses. And of course, method of take. Is it archery, muzzleloader? Is it rifle? And what seasons of rifle are there, right? There's a lot of opportunities in there. Um, you right. There's a lot of research that you can do in order to understand those opportunities and what, what fits your hunting style the best. So when we say a limited license, every single um, license that what we call limited it has a quota associated with it, right? So in some, um, some GMUs for a certain season, um, we call them hunt codes. We'll talk more about hunt codes, but there might be only 10 licenses available for a hunt code. There's some where there's thousands of licenses available for a hunt code. So th there's resources that, that we're gonna show you where you can figure out how much quota is out there, um, what, how, how hard is it gonna be to draw it? So we're, we're gonna get into that, so stick with us. Um, there are some other licenses that are out there. Um, it, when we go through the draw and there's still quota available on some hunt codes, they turn into leftover licenses, right? Those are left over and until, until they're all gone, then, then there's none available. Um, we also have some over-the-counter license options as well. There's some bear licenses, there's some elk licenses that are over-the-counter. Um, so this is stuff that you, you can rely on every year to go hunt in some of these, these areas. 
So um, that that's the majority of these licenses that that I think we want to talk about um, starting out. And we're going to transition. I've I've talked enough. Let's let's listen to another voice. We got Tracy who is going to talk to us about how you can get multiple licenses in a year. Okay, so um, I'm going to start out by talking about what we call our list A, B, and C licenses. And like Brian mentioned, this is how we um, determine if you can get more than one license. So first of all, you can tell whether or not a license is list A, B, or C by looking in the hunt code uh, columns of the draw table. So, and, and just for your reference on page three of the physical brochure and page seven of the big game brochure, you'll find more, um, you'll find the description of this, but we'll start with list A. So list A, you can only have one list A license. Typically those are male licenses are either sex licenses or licenses from real high quality uh, units. Then we have list B. Now list B, you can have in addition to another license. So you could have a list A and a list B, or you could have two list Bs. And then finally we have list C. Those are above and beyond list A and B, and you can have as many as you want. And while that sounds great, they are typically um, either management type hunts or there are auction and raffle, or um, for example, our Eastern Plains elk license is a list C. So they're not always the easiest to obtain um, and can be a little more difficult to hunt. So one thing to keep in mind is that you can only put in one application per species per year, and you're only gonna get one license back from the drawing. So then how do you get multiple licenses? So if you um, get back a list A in the drawing, then you can go and purchase a list B as a leftover license, like Brian was talking about earlier, or you could um, maybe, well, so then list B, if you get a, a list B license, in order to get another license, you can get a list A as a leftover, or you could get another list B um, and, or buy an over-the-counter. Now, I forgot to mention that the way you tell whether or not an over-the-counter license is list A or B is to look next to the information that is next to the map that shows the over-the-counter unit. Okay, so let me jump to uh, how to read a hunt code. And while that may look like Greek, it actually breaks down pretty simply. And I'm gonna share my screen here, but you can also find information on this on either page 10 of the physical brochure or page 14 of the online brochure. You can also find, um, I'm sorry, yeah, so you can find this on page 10 of the physical brochure or page 14 of the, of the online brochure. Okay, so our example here is the hunt code DM014E1R. So our first uh, letter indicates the species. Most of those are pretty self-explanatory, D for deer, E for elk. The one that um, can be a little bit tricky nowadays is A for pronghorn, and that's because this coding was created back when we referred to pronghorn as antelope in the brochure. So your second letter is the sex, so F for female, M for male, E for either sex. The middle set of numbers is the three digit game management unit number. So it's always a three digit uh, set of numbers. So for example, here 014 is unit 14, unit two would be 002, unit 581 is gonna be 581. Now, if you have a hunt code that has a group of units in it, they're always, the code will always be based on the lowest numbered game management unit in that um, cluster of units. Okay, the next set of characters is a letter and a number. So this indicates the season. So for example, here E1 is the early season and you could technically say it's the first early season in case that unit had multiple early seasons, it would be E1 or, or E2 for another early season. You will also see as far as letters go, you will see O, and it is the letter O, not a zero. That indicates our um, regular rifle seasons for deer and elk. So first, second, third, and fourth. And if you're applying online and you type in a zero, it will correct that to the letter O. 
Uh, you will also see P for private land only. You will see uh, a K for youth only. You might see a W or a J for ranching for wildlife and you would see L for late. I always encourage you to double check the season dates. Um, you know, with, with private land, you might have units that have multiple seasons, uh, season dates. Uh, some of them are really long. So you might see a P1 and it runs from September 1st to January 31st. So, so always double check the season dates, uh, even though you can kind of get a feel for what that is in the hunt code. And then the last letter indicates your method of take. So A for archery, M for muzzleloading, or R for the rifle seasons, which also includes any legal method of take during that season. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, refer to the big game brochure on pages um, 10 or 14, depending on which version you're looking at to help you figure that out. And then lastly, I just wanna to touch really quickly a little bit more on the private land only licenses, which Brian mentioned earlier. So keep in mind, you do have to have permission to hunt on private land. Um, and it is your responsibility to get that permission. And you don't have to have permission to, to you don't have to show proof of permission uh, when you apply, but it is your responsibility to have that permission. The advantage to private land only licenses is that they can often be easier to uh, draw because there's less competition. Uh, many of the female species are list B, so you can have an another license in addition to those. And many of our private land seasons are longer seasons. Um, so there are some benefits, but again, you, you are restricted to private land. Um, and I encourage you, if you are hunting on private land, to stop by one of our offices and pick up a courtesy card. Those uh, are great cards where you fill out your information on part, the landowner fills out information on the other part, and then you swap those parts so that uh, the landowner knows who you are, you know, hunting their property. And then uh, you have proof in the field. If an officer stops you, you've got that proof that you can, um, that you, you're uh, hunting on private land legally. So, all right, with that, I'm going to kick it off to Emily to talk a little bit more about the draw process. All right, so I'm going to kind of give the lowdown on the primary draw, four choices, everything like that. We'll touch a little bit on preference points, and then I'll talk about the secondary draw as well. So as far as actually applying, there are two ways to apply. So you can either apply online. So you'd go to our website, click on buy and apply, log into your account, and you can apply that way. Other, other way to do it is to call our phone number. So the easiest place to find that phone number, it's in the brochure top corner of page five in the physical copy. It's our 1-800 phone number. So it's only 1-800 phone number that we have. So if you're wanting to apply over the phone because you're not comfortable with the computer or you just wanna have someone else put it in for you, that's gonna be the best way to do it. Uh, so the first thing to do when you're applying is to make sure that you have your qualifying license so Brian touched on that briefly. So you wanna make sure that you look at that list of qualifying licenses in the brochure. You do have to have that before you can apply. Uh, if you do not have that, the system will automatically not let you apply. So it's not like you can miss that. Um, so if, just make sure you get one of those licenses after it's on your account or even in your cart, you can do your application. So the primary draw is going to be your best opportunity for the most number of licenses and the most diversity of licenses. So if you really want to go hunting, definitely apply to the primary draw. It's going to be your best shot. So some things to think about first is if you're going to be actually hunting or maybe are you just trying to gain preference points for something later on? Because if you're thinking those over-the-counter licenses sound like good ideas, then maybe you just want to apply and gain preference points. So it's something to think about first off the bat. If you are wanting to draw a license, then absolutely apply. And I'll touch on how to gain preference points a little farther down. So the next thing to think about when you're going through your application, the first question it's going to ask you is, are you hunting in a group? So you can either say, no, I'm not hunting in a group. I am a group leader, or yes, I am hunting in a group. Uh, if that's something you wanna do, the group leader always applies first and then Every number, every member of the group can apply after that. Uh, the benefit to applying in a group is if you're in a group of people where you think you either all want to go 
or none of you are going. So like if there's four in your group and one person did not draw, but you say, no, we would still go, then maybe you think about just applying individually. But if it's like, no, nope, we're all going or no one's going, then maybe applying as a group is for you. Uh, there's a lot more information on applying as a group, um, kind of like FAQ on our website. It's on the apply as a group for hunts. So I think we're going to post that link in the chat. But if you go to our website, type group hunts in the search bar, it should pull that web page up for, for you pretty easy. Um, so read through that if you're applying as a group, because there are some things that are important. It's like you all have to apply for the same hunt code with the, except, the exception of the sex being different. So read through that website if you're applying as a group, because it's definitely got lots of good information on there. So after that question, the next page in your application is going to be four choices. So this is where you need to decide on what your hunt codes are going to be. So when you're trying to decide what your hunt code is going to be, you need to think about a few things. So think about what species you want to do. That kind of is usually the easiest question for people to answer. Um, and then what game management unit, so what GMU you want to hunt in. Um, and we'll touch on ways to look at GMUs later. And then which method of take, you do an archery, muzzleloader, rifle, and then what season. So if you're doing rifle, you're gonna do first, second, third or fourth or, or late season or like Tracy talked about, would you consider private land only? So you gotta think about those things. And once you kind of figure that out, you can go to the brochure and the hunt code tables and you can figure out what your hunt code is. So the brochure is broken down by species so you can go to each species and look at the hunt code tables. They're split up into archery, muzzleloader, and rifle. And then you can look at your GMU and then figure out, well, here I want to go in, say, GMU 7 and 8. And then it'll list all of your options. So you can list, look at all those hunt codes and see which one is going to work best for you. So the next thing after you kind of figure out what your hunt codes is, is you got those figured out. You're going to put those in. And I'll talk more about those four choices here in a second. But you'll put your hunt codes in. Your application is going to have you confirm that, add it to your cart. If you want to do other species, you can go back and do all of your species at once. So once you've got all of your species applications in your cart online, then the only thing you have to pay for um, at that point in time is going to be your application fee per species. So the application fee is just a non-refundable cost $7 for residents or $9 for non-residents. And that's all you pay up front. Uh, if you draw the license, you pay for that license when the draw happens. So it's gonna be on your, in the back of your brochure, you'll see those dates there. So it's gonna be May 24th to 28th. Um, the way you pay for those is when you do your application, pay those application fees, you're gonna have the opportunity to save your credit card on file. You can also save a CPW gift certificate if you don't want to do a credit card. But that card is going to be what is charged when the draw happens on those May dates. So just keep that in mind. Um, there's payment deadlines. So just keep in mind that if you do draw, you always, want, always, always, always want to double check that the license has actually been paid for. That's a very key step. All right, so kind of going back in the applications, I mentioned four choices. So the four choices you have per species and they're listed in priority. So first choice is gonna be the one you want the most. Uh, you don't have to fill in all four. You could just fill in one. You could fill in two, three, or all four. Uh, it doesn't change anything on your application. So then preference points, which is a big question that people have. So uh, page nine of the big game brochure, there's a big section that talks about preference points, uh, little bits of them, but I'll just touch on a couple of them of those points there. So preference points are only generated in the primary draw and with your first choice. You can only use preference points in the primary draw and for your for first choice. So keep that in mind. First choice primary draw is the only place you can gain or use your preference points. So how do you gain preference points? There's two ways. So you can either put in the preference point hunt code and the preference point hunt code for each species can be found on the first page of each species section in the brochure. Typically it's P999 
99P. And because the, the first letter in your application is always there automatically. But keep in mind that that hunt code for the preference points can be found on the first page of every species section in your brochure. So you can either put that as your first choice and you could put other hunt codes later in your second, third and fourth choices. The other way to gain a preference point is to put in a hunt code that you really want as your first choice. And if you do not draw it, then you will automatically gain a point. And that applies for elk, deer, pronghorn and bear. There's some exceptions with moose, but I think we're gonna touch on that a little later. Um, those have preference points fees. But so the way to gain them is, say you're wanting to apply to a hunt code and it takes 15 points to draw and you don't have that, or two, however many it takes, then you can just put that hunt code down. If you think, well, I'll give it a shot. You can put that hunt code down and if you do not draw it, you will gain a point. If you know you're not gonna draw it, then that's your decision to make whether or not you wanna put the preference point hunt code or the hunt code. Um, that's up to you, but either way, if you don't draw it, you'll still gain that point. So the way to use points is, like I said before, in your first choice. So if you've applied before maybe and you've got preference points and you're trying to figure out how do I use these, you put the hunt code as your first choice. And if you draw that, then you will um, lose all of your points. If you think, say you apply to a hunt code and it only requires two points typically, and you have four, if you put your that hunt code as your first choice, it will take all four of your points. So it doesn't only take what is necessary, it will take all that you have. So keep that in mind as well. So with the fees I mentioned, there's some with um, moose, Rocky Mountain, bighorn sheep, and goat, but those are gonna be touched, by Josh, touched on by Josh Melby a little later on, so I won't cover those here. So that's kind of the lowdown on the primary draw. And then just to touch briefly on the secondary draw. So the secondary draw used to be called leftover draw, but now we've changed it because there's a few different things with it. So the secondary draw happens after the primary draw is all said and done. The applications open June 16th and it goes until June 30th at 8 p.m. So again, those dates are all in the back of your brochure. So always make sure you're checking the back of your brochure too. So the, the, sorry, the secondary draw is basically going to be any license that was not taken in the primary draw that is a limited license. So what we will do is after the primary draw is all said and done, we will have lists of all of the remaining license, limited licenses posted on our website and on the page uh, the application page where you log in and apply. So you can go through those pages, look at that list, see if there's anything you want. And if there is, then you apply to it. If there's not, then you don't have to apply. So that's kind of depends on what you're wanting to get out of it. So if you apply in the primary and you don't draw a license, you can apply in the secondary. If you apply in the primary and you do draw a license, then based on the A, B, and C list that Tracy was talking about, you can also apply the secondary, just keeping in mind that those A, B, and C list limits. If you do not apply in the primary draw, you can still apply in the secondary draw. So it's not a requirement to apply in the primary to do the secondary. Uh, if you forget to apply in the primary and miss the deadline, then just keep an eye out on that secondary draw list that will be available on our website a little later on. So the secondary draw does require you still to have a qualifying license and you do still have to pay the application fees. So just kind of the same thing as the primary draw. The difference is that the, excuse me, the, the secondary draw has nothing to do with preference points. So you cannot gain or use your preference points in the secondary draw. But that kind of covers a secondary draw. And if there's no other questions, I'll uh, turn it over to Josh. Thanks, Emily. We're gonna have um, Josh start talking about some uh, special consideration licenses here in just a sec. Um, I, if you're new to hunting and, and the applications are new to you, I want you to just relax a minute, take a deep breath, 
because we're going to get into even some more complex opportunities for licenses. Again, these are opportunities. Um, so Josh is going to share with um, with us some of these special license considerations. Again, don't don't look past these. These may be some excellent opportunities to go hunt. So Josh, take it away. All right. So hopefully I'm going to try not to confuse people here. So, um, but we'll talk about some of those. Uh, things are just a little bit different or kind of special circumstances. Um, the first thing we'll talk about is weighted preference points. And these uh, specifically deal with moose, bighorn sheep, and mountain goats. Um, these species are, there's a lot of demand to hunt them and uh, there's not as much opportunity. So um, a way to provide people a chance of drawing those tags um, without having to accumulate more preference points than everybody else. Um, there's a system with weighted preference point. And the way this works is once you um, get three preference points um, for that species, so uh, either of those three, um, you'll start accumulating what they call weighted preference points. Um, when you get a weighted preference point, um, they take your application number um, on your application and they scramble it um, and then they divide that number by the number of weighted preference points plus one and then they put them all in order from the, the lowest number to the highest number and the lowest numbers are the first ones to draw those tags. So in theory, the more weighted preference points you have, the, the lower your number should be and the better chance you have of drawing those tags. But if you're really lucky and just get a low um, number drawn, um, you can still draw that tag. So you always have a chance of drawing those species with that system. And the more preference points you have, the better your chance. Um, next thing we'll talk about is um, youth preference. And this will be on page 17 in the brochure. Um, so, as a way to basically give preference to youth hunters um, and allow them more opportunities to get out there and harvest deer, um, elk, antelope. Um, <clears throat> that basically a minimum of 15% of the available limited licenses for doe pronghorn, antlerless deer, either sex deer and antlerless elk in a GMU are um, allocated towards youth. So youth are gonna get the preference on those license over adults. So even though they might not have as many preference points um, as the adults find, um, they're gonna be able to draw over those adults for those. Um, and just remember youth is anywhere age 12 to 17. So um, another thing we'll mention real quick is the, uh, the hybrid draw. So um, in units where it takes um, 10 or more preference points to draw a tag, um, there's a hybrid draw opportunity. So uh, up to 20% of the licenses available for that hunt code um, are available to um, hunters that apply that have at least five preference points or more. And it's just a, a random drawing. So they'll take all the hunters that don't have enough preference points to draw the tag, um, but have between five and whatever the upper end is. And they'll randomly select um, those hunters for up to 20%. So um, nice opportunity. Um, you can you know, have a chance at drawing one of those really premier hunts in the state um, you know, before you've accumulated 20 preference points or whatever it might be. So, um, a good tip is if you're just planning on applying for a preference point because you know you won't draw that, you know, pure, mere hunt you're saving up for. Um, if you have at least five or more, it's a good idea to put in for one of those hybrid draw hunt codes um, because you never know if you're going to draw it or not. So you at least have a chance. And if you don't, you're still going to get your preference point. Um, uh, the next thing we we'll mentioned real quick is the Ranching for Wildlife program. Uh, Ranching for Wildlife is a partnership between CPW and private landowners. And essentially the, the landowners have allowed um, public access onto their property um, through a limited license. Uh, in return, they get some licenses to use um, 
on their on their ground and, and some habitat work. So um, you'll see some of those hunt codes. Um, they usually have a, a W in them. Um, and those are going to be a ranching for wildlife hunt. So um, a lot of those are, you know, fairly high quality hunts and they're going to give you more of a, a hunt that you would get on, on private property versus um, hunting public ground. So uh, another good option to look at there. So, um, and we'll throw a, a link um, in the chat here to the, uh, the ranching for wildlife. So, um, from there, we're going to move on to just some of the resources that you can use. Um, as far as you know, trying to plan your hunt, um, trying to figure out what hunt code you're looking for. Um, you know, it's kind of daunting when you've got that many hunt codes across the state, and it's, you know, I've only got three preference points, or I've got 20 preference points. What do I need to apply for? What are my chances of drawing? So um, the first thing that I'm going to pull up here. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. So there is a, um, a program on our webpage called the Colorado Hunting Atlas. Um, and what this is, is it's an interactive mapping program. Um, so you can look at the entire state um, and essentially zoom in to whatever area you're looking at. Um, and over on the left side, there'll be all different types of layers you can put in there. It's got aerial photos, um, you know, 2020 fire perimeters, um, a lot of the Forest Service roads. It'll give you all of our office information, campgrounds. Uh, one of the handy features is this hunter resource report. So you can take it and put, um, if you know you're hunting a specific area, you can mark that area um, and you can adjust the buffer. And basically you can print out a report that has all the contact information for campgrounds, uh, area office, uh, sheriff's department, forest service BLM, um, but really a good thing to kind of get you prepared on, you know, uh, where to hunt and um, looking at those um, management units and the boundaries and stuff. So um, if you know this part of the state you want to hunt, but you're not sure what unit, this is a really good place to start. So um, the next thing we will um, look at here is um, the hunting statistics. So, and this is more of kind of getting a little more advanced when you're looking at applying. Um, but on our webpage, we'll throw a link in here, or you can just search hunting statistics. Um, but you can pull up the statistics on all the different species um, that you can apply for. So, and it'll give you, um, <clears throat> so right here, I pulled up the deer hunting one, and it gives you a draw recap report, uh, drawn out report. It'll give you an estimated harvest report and a population estimate. So, and this is essentially the, the data that we use as managers to um, issue licenses. Um, but, and then it'll also show you, you know, what it takes for preference points um, for certain species. So if we look at the draw recap report, it's gonna give you a report like this um, for, you know, a specific hunt code. And essentially you can go through and look at how many resident, non-resident adults um, applied and how many preference points. Um, so if you really wanna get into, um, you know, the statistics and figure out, you know, where your best chances are drawn with the number of points you've got, um, this is where you're gonna do it. So um, they also have a, a drawn out report. Um, so it'll show you uh, what it took for preference points and, you know, how many people drew with that um, based on the hunt code. Um, so, the, the last resource I'll mention, um, and I think Brian has a picture of it, is the Colorado Outdoor Magazine. Um, every year they put out a preference point issue um, and should be available at any of the area offices. Um, but this is probably one of your best resources. So it'll go through and lists all the different hunt codes for the different species across the state. And it's going to show you the minimum number of preference points it took to draw um, that tag over the last three year average. So 
um, really helps you kind of plan on, you know, where you want to apply and what you can have chances of drawing uh, with the number of preference points you've got. Um, with that, I will turn it back over to Brian. So. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, in case you haven't, um, didn't see, I tried to hold it, hold it up. But I'm not sure if you saw the screen. This is Color Outdoors. Um, you can um, subscribe to this fantastic magazine, some beautiful photos, great articles. But once a year, this, this uh, preference point um, article comes out. Um, it's a great, great resource. Um, lots of information on that as well. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end of the night, folks. Um, we've got another um, topic um, and Logan is gonna, gonna join us and he's gonna talk about um, making a plan um, trying to find ways to hunt every year. So Logan, go for it. Yeah, so um, there's always opportunities to hunt something every year. Um, sometimes you can, you know, that's getting something through the draw or some of the other resources to pick up uh, licenses in the leftover draw or the secondary draw. Um, but what I recommend and what I usually do is kind of have three plans. Um, I think Brian calls his plans A, B, and C. Um, and like starting with his lit, like his, you know, plan C is kind of his long-term, um, goals way down the road. So if you're somebody that's just starting out, you know, you don't want to try and get, uh, necessarily the, the, the big mature animal that you, you, you dream of and that dream hunt in the first year, a lot of times those preference points are going to come into play and you're not going to be able to do it right away. So have a long-term goal of what you want to do down the line. And maybe that's something that you don't exactly formulate right away, but, um, keep that in the back of your mind as you kind of look towards um, at your preference points and what units and hunts you're putting in for and hunt codes. Um, but kind of have also uh, an intermediate or a moderate plan um, or kind of a backup plan, maybe for different species. You know, if, if you're really into deer hunting, um, you know, have a backup plan of, you know, maybe having being able to hunt pronghorn um, or something like that um, intermittently throughout uh, your hunting career and getting on some other species. Um, same, same with, you know, hunting deer and elk, if you can get a deer tag in the same season as your elk tag, uh, you know, have that intermediate plan. If it's easier to draw deer tags where you want to go elk hunting, um, hunt up there for deer for a couple of years and use that time in the field, uh, to scout for elk, um, during those same seasons and that same time of year to, to get to know you, the area you're in. Um, and then, you know, have, have a plan for how do I get a tag for this year um, and, and doing the same thing getting, picking up doe tags or, or tags in an area that you want to hunt in um, and use those, those tags as opportunities to scout. It really takes, um, for me, uh, it takes a couple of years to really get to know an area that I'm hunting uh, to where that I feel confident uh, and comfortable in it. And like, I really know what the animals are doing and what their normal movements and stuff like that are. So if you can get out um, every year, even if it's, you know, like I said, getting a doe tag um, and gaining a preference point. So putting in for a preference point on your first choice in a certain unit uh, that you want to hunt a buck in or, or hunt a bull, get a cow tag and, and hunt those units for a couple of years while you accumulate the preference points uh, to get in there uh, and get to know that area. But also just getting time in the field and experience if you're, you're wanting to hunt elk and you're wanting to hunt bull elk and stuff like that, um, make a plan for getting into the premier unit um, down the road and, and hunt some over-the-counter opportunities in the meantime and get experience in the field hunting elk or hunting deer. Uh, but there's lots of ways to do that, but just have a plan for kind of, you know, right now this year, but also next year or in the next couple of years and then long-term plans and goals um, as well. But just have those plans and, and those backup plans and use utilizing the first, second, third, and fourth choices to, to keep those options alive. Um, and then uh, the other thing I'll mention too, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for youth. Um, and on page in the big game brochure, starting on page 17 for the next three pages, it, it outlines. Um, I don't have we don't have time tonight to get into it, but it outlines a lot of opportunities that are there for youth. Um, that uh, especially after the initial draw, um, we give a lot of favor to youth as well as expanded opportunity if they don't harvest in the first season, they have a tag. So if you're a parent and you have a kid um, that's 12 years old and wants to hunt big game, um, definitely utilize getting them in the field and those opportunities and use those 
opportunities of them hunting to do scouting and stuff like that in some of the areas that you're wanting to hunt because like I said sometimes it takes a year or two to kind of figure out what's going on but it can also hunting every year in an area can open up opportunities um, even with private land and on private land getting permission that way uh, so just yeah, have have a plan long term short term um, and uh, kind of in the middle and, and utilize those to get out every year there's always a way to do it um, sometimes you just got to be creative with that um, kept that one kind of short and sweet but Brian I'll send it back to you Awesome. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, all the panelists. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in. We're, uh, we're kind of finishing up our, our presentation point here. So if, if you're um, logged into Facebook Live or if you're on the Zoom webinar, remember, you can ask us some questions. We've got a little bit of time here and we'll, we'll throw those questions around. Um, we do have one question that um, came in through Facebook Live. It's a great question. Um, it's talking about how do we know what the quotas are? Um, so if you're not aware, um, the, sometimes those quotas are set. Um, it goes through the Parks and Wildlife Commission and it's after the deadline for the draw. So there are going to be a handful of hunt codes where the quotas might be different than last year. Most of them are probably gonna be very similar, um, the same as last year. But again, as I, I said earlier in the, in the whole thing, right? Like we manage dynamically. So um, we've got a lot of biologists that are tying in with the district wildlife managers that are um, also tying in with landowners and, and tying in with the community. And they're trying to understand what the populations are doing, going up or down, and how do we need to adjust those populations. That goes before the Parks and Wildlife Commission, and they approve or they maybe they, they adjust those tags a little bit as well. Um, you as, as a public, you can, um, you can view those Parks and Wildlife Commissions. We have a web page um, on CPW um, website. And you can just type in um, Parks and Wildlife Commission and you'll be able to get to the page. You'll be able to um, do a live stream. Um, and they, they cover a whole lot of topics. Um, they'll be meeting here in a couple of, couple of weeks for a couple of days. They put in a lot of effort um, on your behalf. So um, anyone can tune in and listen to what's going on on that as well. Um, the other thing you can do if you want to find out maybe the direction that some of the biologists, DWMs, are, are leaning towards in a unit that you're interested in, Again, you can call up the, the closest office to the unit that you want to hunt in and you can ask, hey, is, is any chance I can talk to a biologist or talk to a, a local DWM of this GMU? I'm, I'm interested if those, if those quotas are going up or down before I apply. Go ahead and, and, and do that. Um, realize that a lot of these folks are out in the field quite a bit as well. So um, be patient. It may take a little bit of time before they are out of the field and they're actually in the office and they can see emails or get some some of their voicemails and stuff, but um, some of the hardest working folks we have in the agency um, working on your behalf to protect your wildlife and to um, keep people safe out in the field. So they're, they're working hard out there um, on your behalf. Um, I'm, I just wanna follow up real quick on, on what our panelists have been saying, um, what, what we've been presenting. Um, it is very complex. It's complicated system in Colorado. But hopefully we shed some light on, um, on how the process works and how you can get a license. And like Logan was saying, you can hunt this year. There's always a fallback. And, and it could be your fallback is, is just the over-the-counter elk licenses. You got a couple of archery opportunities. You got whether it's, it's second or third rifle bull. Um, there's maps in the brochure to, to figure out where those at. You can fall back on that. And this summer, you can go scout some of those properties, um, some of those lands where, uh, where you want to hunt. Go scout them in the summertime. So when the hunt season comes, you're ready to go. You're, you're ready to hunt. You're familiar with the area. You know the access in. Uh, maybe you've seen some sign over the summer. Um, the, the other things, right? Like, like that's kind of my plan A. I, it's something that I can rely on every year. It might be um, when I look through the statistics that Josh shared with you right you look through those statistics and you're looking at well i know this hunt code based on the statistics it drew out at third choice or fourth choice in the primary draw last year that might be something that you want to think about putting in for right like but but maybe you can still get your preference point and then put that hunt code down for your second choice um right you can play the game that way a little bit um think about um you know like like, like come up with a plan come up with a strategy use those resources. You can, you can do some scouting this year um, before the leftover lists come out. 
Um, one of the things that I, I learned uh, a couple of years ago is that whenever that leftover list becomes available, even before the leftover um, list is before leftover day, it's made available a little bit before the, the leftover draw day. Um, I will save that leftover list because this helps me in future years, right? Like what, what tags actually go to leftover? And that list is updated as, as the licenses are, are purchased, that list drops and drops. Well, I don't want to wait to the very end. I want to make sure I have that list so I know, hey, this tag is one that I want to go. I want to go hunt that unit. It usually goes to leftover. I might put that hunt code down in the secondary draw. Right. I'm going to try and get that tag before everyone else is fighting for it on leftover day. Right. So you can use those strategies to your advantage. If you use um, the youth preference that's out there, if you're a parent and you've got a youth who's who's 12 years old to 17 years old, what a fantastic opportunity to, to get a good license for your youth. As an adult, you don't have to necessarily carry a rifle out there. Invest in your future favorite hunting buddy. Go take them out but maybe that's a unit you want to hunt in a couple of years. So you get to take them out into a good unit. You give them a quality hunting experience, but you're scouting it for a future hunt that maybe you're going to draw after you get a couple of preference points, right? Like these are great things that you can try and plan out. And then my plan C, um, just like Logan's saying, right? Like you can, you can plan for a hunt in five years and get five preference points. There's some hunt codes that take over 20 years to draw. It's a quality hunt. It might be a once in a lifetime hunting opportunity. But don't just think, okay, I got to get preference points. That means I can't hunt. You can hunt. You can look through the statistics. You can look through the reports. You can call up and ask for some help. We have a hunt planner that you can call. Um, in the first couple of pages are your big game brochure up on the top. I believe it's on page um, three on your big game brochure. Big game brochure way up on the header. There's a number in there that you can call and talk to someone about a hunt planner, right? We call them a hunt planner. They can talk to you and they can help you out. So um, I am curious. I, I think I'm probably done blabbing and blabbing. I'm wondering um, from our folks, do we have questions that are out there that we haven't answered yet? Panelists, do you guys have any questions? And Doug, if, uh, if you can, feel free to weigh in. If you got questions on Facebook Live, we're here for a few more minutes, folks. If you got some questions, we wanna help you out. Again, if you're on the Zoom webinar, hit the Q&A button to ask a question. If you are in Facebook Live, go ahead and, and in the comments, ask your question away and we'll try and spend some time answering them. Right. I am not hearing or seeing a whole lot. We must have done a good job trying to answer most of those questions. Again, as, as uh, we get closer and closer to the deadline and you start doing your homework, you start looking through um, the statistics, you're looking at the hunting atlas, um, you know, trying to figure this out. Um, if you've got questions, please reach out to our customer service representatives. They want to help you. Um, we want to see you get out there in the field. We want you to buy those licenses because that, that helps us manage your wildlife even better. It helps us provide more opp opportunities and more places to hunt and fish. So again, on, on behalf of all the, the panelists, um, I want to I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, we do have a couple of questions coming in. So before I end this, let's, uh, let's see once if we can do those. And panelists, if you guys want to answer any of these questions, feel free to to um, join in and we'll just answer some of these live. Um, we got a, a question that came out. Do you have to wear hunter orange to hunt on private land only properties? Um, uh, would uh, uh, one of the officers, do you want to handle that one? Um, yes. So if it is a, uh, a rifle tag um, or a muzzleloader tag, um, you're required to wear um, daylight fluorescent orange or fluorescent pink um, for any of those hunts, whether it's a private land only or a public tag. Great. Thank you. Um, we got a question that came from Facebook about um, a hunter whose son is 11 right now, but turns 12 in May. Can he get a qualifying license now to apply? Emily. Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah. 
He can. So as long as he's going, basically, as long as a youth is going to be 12 by the time fall comes around and um, actually the hunting season comes, then you can apply. So if he's 11 now, as long as he's got hunter education, you can get him that qualifying license, you can put in in the draw, and then uh, he'll, if he draws a license, he'll be 12 by the time the hunting season comes around. So yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Emily. Um, I saw there was a question just a minute ago too, which I think is a good, good question that maybe everyone wants to understand. Group licenses are really confusing. Um, I've, I've dealt with, um, and, and I think most of the folks that are panelists here have probably dealt with thousands of hunters that have applied. And you know, sometimes we hear a lot of the same questions or, or, or as they're trying to relate some stuff, some confusion. Um, group applications are, are challenging. So one of the questions was if, if uh, a hunting partner, you know, my girlfriend, my wife, my boyfriend, my cousin, um, family member wants to hunt together, do we have to apply as a group? The answer is, is no, um, you don't have to apply. Um, in the group applications, it, it, you apply as a group, you have a group leader. Um, if one of the people in your group uh, um, gets drawn, everyone gets drawn as long as there's still quota available. So it may increase the odds of your group getting drawn, but if you got five people in the group and when that first person gets drawn in the draw process, but there's only like three licenses left, that group doesn't get to go because there's not enough licenses for everybody. Um, read through that link that we sent you on, on group applications um, on our website. It, it, there are a lot of rules you have to follow to understand it correctly. Um, yeah, everyone goes or no one goes. You go in at the lowest preference point. Whoever is in your group has the lowest preference point. That's how your whole group goes in. Um, it, you've got to make sure that you're applying um, very specific, right? Like the whole group has to apply um, for every choice. It has to be the exact same application code, right? That, that you put in except for gender, right? Like the antler versus non-antler. Um, but yeah, that, that is a good question on group applications. Um, you do not have to, um, you don't have to apply as a group if you don't want to. Um, if, if someone in your group is like, well, if I don't draw, I'm still coming up and I'll be a cook. Just realize that the group application does not mean party hunting as well. Um, party hunting is illegal in Colorado. What, and party hunting is, is basically, you know, you have three people in your group and two, two bull tags, one cow tag. And, uh, you know, someone says, oh, if you see a cow, you can, you can shoot my tag. That's illegal. We don't do party hunting in Colorado. Um, you, you harvest or you have the opportunity to harvest the license that you drew or the license that, that you hold. Um, so, so make sure you don't confuse group application with party hunting. I, I've had that question come up a couple of times. Um, we got another question that um, is coming up. Um, this is a question about um, uh, a unit that was um, hit by wildfire last year. And this is, there's a lot of good um, questions about that. I'm wondering if any of the officers or Emily, um, Tracy, any of you have a good answer about what to do um, about applying in, in those units where, where maybe last year you applied, you had a license, but you had to turn it in and you couldn't hunt. Emily, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we've been dealing with the Cayman Peak fire. And while it's not the one that was mentioned in the question, it's a good question. Um, so getting in touch with the local office is going to be the best way. Um, and what we would do is we would get you in touch with either the biologist or district wildlife manager, because those are the people People who've been on the ground the most and are going to have the best information, most accurate information. Um, it's going to probably be a little hard to say right now because it's winter, snowfall, the animals are in different locations than they're going to be next fall. Um, but they may have seen what happened right after the fires and how severe the burns were. So yeah, call your local office. We'll get you in touch with someone who really knows a lot more about that area than, than someone like myself who's at the front desk. But. Yeah, great. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, if you're thinking about hunting in some of those areas that have been hit by wildfire, just, just realize some of that's been on Forest Service land, BLM property. Um, it's crossed a lot of private land too. Um, so some of that, some of the access to get in those areas might might just be too hazardous right now. Or, um, you know, I, I've dealt with a little bit of fire in, in, in a past career and I, I've seen the destruction that comes in sometimes with, um, with some of the flooding that comes in after a fire until you get the vegetation to grow in again. And, and sometimes it'll, it'll wipe out complete roads. So, uh, right. You got hazard trees that are partially burnt, but they haven't fallen over yet. So the land managers are, are kind of looking out for safety on your behalf. So if you see some closures, 
um, you know, make, make sure you abide by those. Um, it, it, it's for your safety. It's for your good. Um, the other thing is that if you want to go look in the area, you're hunting on forest service property or BLM, or you're interested in that, you can always call up their local um, ranger district offices. Um, you can look online. Sometimes they have information as well on, um, you know, current closures. So I, I like to check that out before I ever go hunt in a, in a unit is just to make sure, can I get in there? Can I get it? Can I not get out, get in there? Um, one of the units that I hunted last year, um, even though where I hunted wasn't in the burn, um, the access for me to get into was closed. Um, so we, we all have um, some challenges and, and wildfires were, were pretty serious last year. If you do go out and hunt and there's fire bans, please don't have a fire. We, we got to protect our resources out there, folks. So please join in and, and help us all to protect our, our resources. The wildlife, thank you. I thank you. The other hunters, thank you. Um, we've got a strategy question um, coming up. Uh, let's see, if you're hunting on private land only, and it is fairly easy to draw a specific tag, but you also want to build preference points, how would you manage tackling that situation? Obviously, this would be an opinion. Um, that, that is a good question. I like that question. I like, I like your thinking strategy um, on this, right? To, to your, your advantage, you're learning something in what we're saying. Um, you, you're understanding the process and you're, now you're just trying to flesh it out for what works for you. So, so good job. Keep, keep thinking that way. Um, does anyone want to tackle that question or I can try and answer that as well? Logan, thank you. Yeah, I'm muted there. So I would, uh, for that, check the stats and see what the odds are of drawing that tag on a second choice. Um, because if you can draw it on a second choice, then put in for a preference point for first and then draw your private land tag as a second choice. But if it's a 50-50 chance of people from the last few years in the looking back at the stats, um, you're taking a gamble that you may or may not draw that tag as a second choice. And thus you have to decide, is it worth the gamble to get your private land tag and get a preference point? Or would you rather forfeit the, the opportunity at a preference point to ensure that you draw that tag on your first choice? Because if it's 50, if it's a 50, 50 chance in the second choice, then you're definitely getting it in your first choice. So um, it's going to be up to you, but um, that's where, you know, for me, I, I look through that stuff all the time and it's always a matter of looking at the stats um, from the last several years and kind of seeing what the trend has been. It's not a guarantee of what's going to happen. So you kind of, you know, like I said, it's, it's a gamble, but, but look at what's been happening in that area. Um, and then, and then play your odds from there. However you prefer to do it. All right. Good. Yeah. I, I, uh, been in that situation myself on, on just trying to figure out, do I want to draw a preference point? Do I want to get a tag? And, and, uh, I got a unit that I like to apply for, um, to go on a, on a deer archery hunt. And it's a, it's a great tag to get. It draws out, you know, I got about a one in three opportunity on second choice. And for quite a few years, I put in for a preference point because I wanted to do a, a rifle buck hunt. Um, and, but, but I didn't draw and I didn't hunt deer for, for five years until I, finally I did draw that tag, but I didn't, I didn't hunt. I, I actually wasn't the one that drew, right. I had a one in three chance, but for five years, I wasn't, I wasn't the lucky one to draw. Um, so now I'm thinking, okay, well, I I'm, I'm back to zero points. So, so I choose, cause I want to, I want to hunt that every year. I've got, it's a long season. So I'm going to hunt it every year. So I'm going to put that for my first choice. I'm, I'm, I'm not putting in for preference points. That that's my personal choice because I just want to go get meat in the freezer and I can go get this, this archery tag. Um, it gives me an opportunity to get out and it, it works for me. Um, other people of course are going to have their own opinion on that as well. Um, we do have a, another, um, question that came through as well. I think through, uh, um, Facebook, um, crossbows, is it only for disabled hunters? Um, so, so there, there's, there's like two answers to that question as well. Um, I see Tracy is, is typing a little bit in some of our, our, uh, little chat that we have behind the scenes. Tracy, would you want to, um, come on in and, um, would you like to, uh, uh, answer that or would you like me to try and answer that? Uh, yeah, so um, crossbows during archery season are not legal unless you have a special accommodation permit um, for a disability. 
However, they can be used during the rifle seasons. Uh, rifle seasons are actually rifle and all legal methods of take. And if you look on page 14 of the physical brochure, it's probably page 19 of the online brochure, um, you'll find more information on that under number five. It'll give you the minimum qualifications um, for a legal crossbow. Great, thank you, Tracy. Um, it doesn't look like we have a whole lot more questions unless I've um, missed some of those. I'm gonna look real quick, but um, I believe we have answered all the current questions that are out there from Facebook Live and from, um, from our Zoom webinar. So with that, I think we're gonna sign off. We're gonna let everyone go home and um, hopefully we can, uh, um, hopefully we've helped out um, and, and tried to clear some things up. I know it's still confusing, but, but kind of, uh, you know, look through um, the reds, look through the brochure, look through those links that we sent you online. Those are a lot of resources. Um, again, you got, you got resources to call up for customer service. You've got the hunt planner number that's on, on uh, I think page three of the brochure. You got a lot of resources that are out there. So with that, we are gonna sign off um, tonight. Thank you for joining us. We wish you the best of luck in the draw. We wish, wish you the best of luck um, if you get your tag and get out hunting. Um, great adventures. Again, I encourage you, don't, don't just go out by yourself, invite a new person. There's people that, that would love to learn from you. And I, I bet you you're a pretty good teacher. If you've got any, any knowledge of hunting or if you're just starting, Go start with someone else. Go go start a new group. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us and we will sign off. We'll, we'll hopefully see you at another webinar. Good night.